So I would like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Kaveh Kusari is a board certified urologist who provides complete urological care for men and women with a focus on incontinence management. He's experienced in performing procedures to treat benign conditions and cancer using open laparoscopic, robotic, and endoscopic approaches to urologic surgery. Dr. Kusari received his medical degree at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, where he also completed his urology residency in partnership with Barnes Jewish Hospital. Before joining Capital Health, Dr. Kusari saw patients at St. Luke's Center for Urology, part of St. Luke's University Health Network in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where he started a neuromodulation program that quickly became one top tibial nerve stimulation providers in the nation. Before pursuing a career in medicine, Dr. Kosari received his undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, and worked as an engineer for Nike. In his free time, he enjoys cooking, skiing, hiking, soccer, music, playing percussion, and travel. Welcome, Dr. Kosari. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, for that introduction. Um, I don't know how you found out so much about me. Um, and you kind of stole my first slide there, so <laughs> I put it up. Um, uh, so we can, uh, you know, move on to the next slide, I guess. But uh, thank you all for, for, for joining. And I'm very uh, excited to be with everyone tonight and talk about this stuff as I'm very, very passionate about it. So, um, so yeah, um, let me see here, sorry. All right, there we go. So yeah, I just kind of titled this uh, talk Men's Health 101. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, topics that we can discuss in men's health, um, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot more than, than we can talk about in, you know, one session. So I decided for the first session to really uh, focus on, uh, you know, uh, things that really um, affect uh, prostate cancer survivors. Uh, so things like uh, incontinence or leakage of urine and erectile dysfunction. Now, obviously, uh, lots, you know, lots of men can have these issues and not have had prostate cancer uh, surgery. Um, but I thought I would start there. And if, you know, if uh, people like the talk and there's good feedback, um, you know, I'd be happy to do further talks in the future and discuss things like BPH or an enlarged prostate, you know, low testosterone kidney stones or whatever anybody else uh, thinks uh, would be a good uh, discussion uh, to have. Um, so we'll get started uh, first talking about urinary uh, function and uh, incontinence. Um, so uh, I, I think it's always good to start with the anatomy. And so, you know, Here's a little uh, a picture of, of, of the, the male anatomy, uh, the, gen uh, the genito urinary system of, of a man. And you can see uh, this is uh, the bladder which stores the urine until we're ready to go to the bathroom. Um, and then you have the urethra, which is the tube that brings the urine out through the penis and out of the body. And along that urethra, right under the bladder is the prostate. And the prostate's the gland that uh, uh, basically what its function is, is to uh, make a lot of the fluid that goes into the semen. Uh, and then, you know, other than that, it just causes uh, headaches. Um, the uh, right under the prostate are the urinary sphincters or the muscles that uh, squeeze to close off the urethra and hold the urine in the bladder until we're ready to urinate. Now, this picture over here, uh, is to demonstrate a, a man's anatomy after the prostate's been removed uh, for prostate cancer. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, so that's what this picture is depicting here. And uh, this next slide, you know, basically talks about, so, uh, you know, what happens during urination? Well, actually the first thing that happens is these sphincter muscles start to relax and that starts to allow urine to uh, exit the bladder and hit the urethra. And when it starts hitting the urethra, uh, there is what we call a feedback loop. Uh, you know, it's just how we are wired. And once it starts hitting the urethra, the body senses that and sends a signal up to the bladder to say, hey, it's time to pee. And then the bladder, uh, which is a big bag that's also a muscle, uh, squeezes down 
to um, to uh, push the urine out. Uh, so you have two things going on: the sphincter muscles relaxing to open the way for the urine, and then the bladder squeezing to push the urine out. So, so now that we got the anatomy down a little bit, you know what is incontinence? Well, that's just the uh, involuntary loss of urine. Um, so you know having urine leak when you're not ready to go to the bathroom. Um, so, and there's a lot of uh, terminology out there. So I wanted to also kind of review that, um, you know, <clears throat> there are different types of incontinence or leakage. Um, um, and then there's also this term overactive bladder. So overactive bladder is basically uh, patients that have to go to the bathroom frequently or when they have to go, they have to go urgently. They don't have time to wait. Uh, you know, they're running to the bathroom as quick as possible. You know, those are signs and symptoms of an, uh, of an overactive bladder. And along with an overactive bladder down here is urge incontinence. So that's leakage of urine that's, that occurs when, right after somebody has a strong urge to urinate. So, you know, you say, oh my goodness, I have to, to go pee, but before you can get, even get to the bathroom, you're starting to go. And that's urge incontinence. Now, uh, there's another type of leakage that is called stress incontinence. And that's the leakage of urine when, when you do something that increases the pressure in your belly. And hence, you know, going back to our picture here, you know, whatever you're doing that increases the pressure in your belly uh, also then also increases the pressure inside the bladder. And that increase of pressure uh, is enough to overcome these muscles that are supposed to hold the urine in and some urine leaks out, okay? So that could be, you know, things like laughing, sneezing, coughing, lifting something heavy, standing up, um, uh, all those types of things, you know, jumping jacks, what have you, uh, that basically increase the pressure enough to get some urine past those muscles, okay? Um, now, uh, and then um, now, because these the, this leakage is uh, occur for different reasons, they have different treatments. Okay, again, the urge incontinence is when your bladder squeezes when it's not supposed to, and then the stress incontinence is when these muscles aren't strong enough, and anything that happens to increase the pressure is enough to get some urine past there. Uh, and then you can also have mixed incontinence, which is a combination of both stress and urge, and we you know we see that. Uh, sometimes where uh, patients have a little bit of both. All right, so what causes incontinence? So, you know, th there's a lot of reasons for incontinence. You know, in men, a, a big reason is prostate cancer surgery and radiation, those types of treatments. But, you know, a lot of other things like just having an enlarged prostate over time can cause these symptoms. Uh, diabetes, MS, you know, Parkinson's disease, stroke, you know, these things that affect the neurological system that regulates these muscles that are supposed to work together in coordination, that can all cause leakage as well. And then obviously other surgeries in the pelvis, if, if they damage these structures or trauma to the pelvis, like a crush injury, say in a car accident or, you know, construction work or something where somebody has their pelvis crushed, uh, that obviously can cause, cause these issues. Now this slide is pretty uh, self-evident. You know why why treat incontinence? Well, you know um, leaking of urine. You know, unfortunately, uh, as a society, you know, something is not considered socially socially acceptable, and so you know this can cause a lot of mental distress to to, to people. You know, they may feel you know dirty or may feel be afraid that they smell. Uh, they may uh, cause, cause negative uh, feelings of, uh, of themselves. Uh, it may limit what they do. You know, they may not want to go out because of these issues. It may, you know, they may uh, limit what activities they can do because of, you know, they have to wear pads or they um, uh, are, uh, you know, worried that they're going to have leakage if they do something that's going to, you know, cause, cause leakage, like lifting heavy things or exercising, et cetera. And then obviously, you know, also it can uh, cause uh, problems in the skin if you're always wet. Uh, 
it could be expensive. These pads and, and, and clothing items are expensive. Having to do laundry all the time can be expensive. So, you know, obviously we want to treat it. I mean, that, that all makes sense. Um, you know, what this slide is all about is basically it's, it's a common issue. Basically everything I'm going to talk about today, you know, urinary leakage, erectile dysfunction, these, these issues are very common. Unfortunately, um, they're issues that we tend not to want to talk about or don't talk about. So people that have these issues may think that they are not common because people don't talk about it, but they are common. You can see, you know, 17% of men over the age of 60 suffer from some urinary leakage. And men after prostate surgery, uh, they're, you know, can have high rates of leakage. And so, uh, it is common. So then the next thing is, you know, these, the next slides are basically what can we do about this? Uh, and we'll start with some conservative things uh, that can be done, like behavioral modification. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of men on their own will limit how much fluid they take in, which can be a problem, obviously, right? We, we, need, we need to drink enough water for our health. Um, but People will avoid drinking because they don't want to deal with the, the these symptoms. Um, you know, we, you people try avoiding uh, bladder irritants like caffeine, uh, alcohol. Uh, you know, spicy foods can irritate the bladder. Tomato-based foods like red pasta sauces can irritate the bladder. Um, acidic uh, foods can irritate the bladder. Nicotine. Um, you know, these are all things we know irritate the bladder and can worsen these symptoms. So avoiding those things can help. And then doing pelvic floor exercises. Uh, you may have heard of Kegel exercises. And these are exercises where you're squeezing these muscles that are supposed to help hold the urine in. Uh, so, you know, while you're sitting watching TV, squeezing those muscles, you know, uh, I always tell people to think about like, you know, you're, you're on a hike and, uh, uh, you have to go to the bathroom and you, you, you pull off the trail and, and to go urinate. And then uh, you hear people walking uh, down the trail and you want to stop urinating. Those muscles you would squeeze to stop urinating and, and, and uh, um, would be the ones you want to squeeze uh, for these exercises. And, you know, these exercises can be effective, uh, uh, um, especially uh, right, you know, that's something that I, I focus on strongly uh, with men right after surgery is I send all my patients uh, who I do prostate cancer surgery on uh, for physical therapy uh, and to meet with my nurse practitioner, Kathy, to do biofeedback, um, uh, to make sure they're squeezing the right muscles and, and, and doing these exercises because around that first year, you can see significant improvement in, um, in leakage uh, with these exercises. After, you know, if you're more than a year out though from your prostate surgery, uh, it's very unlikely that uh, you're gonna see significant gains uh, with just exercise alone. Um, again, in terms of treatment, uh, conservative treatments, obviously uh, absorbent products like pads and garments, you know, like uh, pull-up garments uh, can help uh, obviously uh, absorb the urine that's leaking, but, you know, that, you know, obviously that's not a, a, a great uh, treatment option because it, again, can cause skin irritation. Uh, you may have an odor. It may be bulky and, and noticeable. So, you know, uh, for some men, this is all they want and that's fine. You know, this is a very personal choice, uh, but for other men, they may say, you know what, just wearing pads isn't going to cut it. There are penile clamps that look like uh, medieval torture devices. Um, basically, uh, these are external to the penis. You would basically put your penis in between here, and then this wedges or, or shuts close, uh, and the penis would be in between these two pads here. Uh, this is another type of clamp. Uh, again, the same thing. The idea is you're externally compressing the penis uh, to hold the urine in there. You know, this option, uh, you know, for some guys, it's, it could be an option for, you know, if you're going out, out uh, to do an activity for an hour or two, uh, but, uh, you know, wearing these things long-term can be painful can, and can cause, you know, again, skin breakdown and problems. Uh, but uh, that's uh, something that we utilize at times for men um, to just wear a clamp if they're just going out uh, for an hour or two. 
There's also catheters uh, that can be used. There's uh, external catheters like these ones here on the right side. These are condom catheters. So the, the, basically they look like condoms. The penis would go in here and then the urine that leaks out would go through these tubes here and into a bag. Um, and again, this is a good, you know, for an elderly patient, that's not a good surgical candidate. Uh, maybe they have nighttime issues when they're in bed. They, you know, the, the, these uh, are, uh, can be utilized. Um, uh, but again, they, they can also cause discomfort, skin breakdown. They can fall off in the middle of the night and then you have an, act, uh, you know, an issue in bed. Um, so they're, again, not perfect, but a, another option that's out there for men. And then there's also these internal catheters. So this is the end of the catheter that would sit inside the bladder. This balloon inflates and holds it in place. Uh, and then the urine uh, comes out through here and into a bag. Um, again, uh, not a great long-term option for most men. Uh, you know, again, it can have a risk of urinary tract infection uh, with having a catheter all the time. Um, it can erode through the urethra over time, uh, you know, so it's not a great long-term fix, but for some men, you know, especially if they're debilitated, elderly, not healthy, uh, you know, it's kind of a final resort. That brings us to, you know, what I focus on, which is surgical treatment options for, for urinary leakage. Um, the first option is not one that I uh, offer because I just don't think it works well at all. And that's bulking agents. So basically, that's going into a uh, going into the bladder with a camera. Sorry, going back to this picture here. So we would go in with a camera into the bladder, and here we would inject some bulking agents to beef up this tissue and uh, you know uh, close this area down. Uh, the downside, you know, obviously the the plus side to it is it's it's pretty minimally invasive. You're not, you know making any incisions or anything like that. But the downside is, like I said, it doesn't work well. You may have to inject multiple times. Over time, this material that you inject can, uh, can migrate to other areas and cause problems and, 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 and the results really deteriorate over time. So I don't really even offer this to my patients. Uh, the two options that I do offer, the first one is uh, what's called a sling. Uh, we also see this in women, uh, for, for women that also have leakage with laughing and sneezing, coughing. Well, that's what we usually do for women is a sling. Uh, for men, uh, there's also a sling that's a bit bigger. This is a uh, close-up of it. It's, it's a mesh uh, product, and basically it acts like a hammock. So it goes around the urethra. You know, this is this, I don't know, is that purple? Uh, is the urethra here, and it basically acts like a backboard so that the, the urethra has some more support. So when you cough and things like that, the urethra doesn't open and, and have urine leak out. Leak out. Um, you know, this is a surgery, it takes about an hour and a half. There's an incision here in the perineum. Uh, this, you know, that's the area between the, the scrotum and the anus. Uh, we make a little incision here to put this device in. And then uh, there's two little poke hole incisions here also to tighten it up. Um, you know, Again, this is, this is a, a great option for men that have minor leakage. You know, so I have patients that come in and say, look, doc, I had prostate cancer surgery and I'm almost dry. Uh, maybe I'm wearing one or two pads a day, you know, especially if I go to the gym or something like that, I have leakage and it bothers me. Uh, this is a good option. But if men come in with severe leakage, you know, three, four, you know, I, I see guys that wear up to eight pads a day, that type of leakage, this is not going to cut it. It's 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 not going to cut it. Um, uh, it can decrease the amount of pads maybe, but it's not going to get somebody fully dry that has that significant amount of leakage. And for that, um, what I recommend is an artificial urinary sphincter. Um, this is you know I do a, like like uh, Maggie was saying I do a, a wide range of surgeries for a lot of. Uh, a lot of conditions, uh, urological conditions, and but this has to be my all-time favorite surgery that I do, just because it's it's so slick and it and it really changes people's lives. And you know, as surgeons, that's what we like. We like something that really works and really makes a difference right away. That's why we didn't go into you know internal medicine where we put people on blood pressure medicines and we don't really see uh, you know a big 
change all of a sudden in, in a person's life. You know, we like to see that big change right away. So this is, for that reason, this is one of my favorite, or is my favorite surgery, I should say. Um, how this works is it's, it's, it's this device here and it has three components, okay? There's a urethral cuff and it looks just like a little tiny blood pressure cuff that wraps around the urethra, okay? And that fills with fluid and squeezes the urethra shut. And uh, then there's a, uh, a pump or, or a button, you could call it. Uh, and this sits inside, the, you know, under the skin. This is all inside the body. Nobody sees this. Uh, but this sits inside the scrotum next to the testicles. And so um, what happens is you push, you squeeze down here at the bottom of the pump that releases the fluid that's in this cuff. That fluid goes out of the cuff and goes into this balloon, this little tiny balloon, okay? And the cuff opens and you pee. So you squeeze this button and then you pee. And what this balloon does is just like any other balloon, it wants to go back down. And so it starts pushing the fluid back into the cuff. So you just squeeze this button, you pee, and this automatically, over the course of a minute or two, closes again on its own. So you don't have to hit any other button to close it. So you just go in the bathroom, squeeze that, pee, and then it closes. And this, you know, men could be, you know, going through eight pads a day, just dripping, just constant dripping leakage of urine. And after this surgery, they are uh, pretty much completely dry and not wearing any pads. So this is a great, uh, great procedure. The surgery itself takes, you know, an hour and a half. Uh, I keep patients in the hospital one day after this procedure or for one night uh, uh, after the procedure just to give some extra IV antibiotics. Um, and the patients go home the next day. Um, uh, it works really well. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, as far as risks of the procedure go, you know, any sort of mechanical device could have mechanical failure, but that's very rare. You know, this device has been around a very long time and they haven't really changed much on the design because it's, it's so effective and works so well. Sometimes men seven, eight years after surgery may come in and say, hey, I'm starting to leak again. And that's usually not a problem with the actual device. But what can happen over time is, you know, this is constantly squeezing on the urethra. So that area of the urethra isn't getting the best blood flow. And so over time, that part of the urethra may start to shrink. And I measure this cuff out individually for, for the patient's urethra and, you know, to, to a certain size. And so if the urethra starts to shrink, this can become loose. And so what happens if that happens, then we just go back in, put in a new smaller cuff or move the cuff to, an, you know, either up here or down here, just to another location. Um, but, and, you know, the patients, uh, you know, when I see men back after this surgery, they, you know, the main thing they say is, gosh, I wish I would have done this years ago. So in summary, you know, incontinence is very common. It's just not talked about. Um, and uh, there are a lot of effective treatments out there and men don't realize that, unfortunately. Um, you know, these surgeries that the sling, this artificial urinary sphincter, is not a common surgery. It's a very rare surgery. Most urologists out there don't even do it, don't know much about it. Uh, so unfortunately, there are a lot of patients out there that don't get the treatment they need. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the main takeaways uh, that I, I wanted people to take away from, from this portion of the talk. And at this point, if there's any questions about uh, urinary incontinence, I'd be happy to take them. If anybody has questions right now, feel free to ask. You can just unmute yourself. Okay, I guess no questions. Okay, well, there'll be time again at the end also for questions if anybody thinks of something uh, uh, or didn't hit their unmute button in time. Um, you can also type in any questions if you want in the chat. Um, and I can answer those again at the end. Um, um, and, you know, if, if you have personal questions and you just don't feel comfortable uh, asking questions in this uh, setting, 
uh, you know, at the end, I will have my contact information uh, and I'd be happy to, to see you in the office to discuss your personal situation. So now I'm gonna jump to uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, and, you know, what is erectile dysfunction? Well, it's the inability to achieve or maintain uh, an erection that's firm enough to have satisfactory sexual intercourse, okay? Um, and again, another common problem that we just, as a society, don't tend to discuss. So one out of five men that are over the age of 20 are suffering from erectile dysfunction. So that's approximately 30 million men in America, okay? So uh, um, people should not feel like they're alone if they have this issue. What causes erectile dysfunction? Well, there's a host of things uh, such as prostate cancer surgery or radiation for prostate cancer, you can see. But, you know, a majority of it is just issues, vascular issues uh, and issues with the nerves, right? So when we're gonna talk about, you know, what an, how uh, an erection is achieved uh, physiologically, and you can see it's basically has to do with nerves and blood vessels and blood flow. And so anything that affects the nerves like diabetes or affects the blood flow uh, it can cause erectile dysfunction. And erectile dysfunction can be a very early sign of heart disease. And I always stress that with my patients when they come in to see me for this issue is because you know the size of the blood vessels that feed the blood into the penis for an erection are about the same size as the ones that feed the heart. And so if these are getting clogged, the uh, vessels in the heart can be getting clogged. So it can be, you know, if you all of a sudden start having erectile dysfunction and you haven't had a good, um, excuse me, I'm trying not to cough here. <coughs> if you're not, uh, you know, um, and you haven't had recent evaluation of your cardiovascular system, uh, you know, uh, I always stress you should talk to your doctor and make sure you've had an EKG stress test, these types of things. Now, uh, also medications, uh, a big side effect of a lot of blood pressure medications, for example, can be erectile dysfunction. So these slides are basically uh, about uh, how erections work. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's, it's blood flow. Uh, so what happens is you have some sort of stimulation, either psychological or physical stimulation, and, uh, and uh, neurotransmitters through nerves cause uh, smooth muscles in the blood vessels to relax, increasing blood flow into the penis. And the penis basically, here, let me see this. I'm gonna try something fancy here. Uh, and so the penis has, uh, is, you can think of it as three tubes. So if you're looking down the barrel, is this, yeah, there we go. If you're looking you know, straight down the barrel of the penis uh, in a cross section, there's three tubes, one, two, and three, okay? Oh gosh, I don't know what that line popped up for. But anyways, uh, that's just supposed to be a circle there. Um, you know, the bottom tube is the urethra that we were talking about that you know, carries the urine or semen out. Uh, and then these top two tubes that they're showing here are called the corpora. And these tubes fill with blood. And as they fill with blood, um, the penis elongates and enlarges. And uh, it, the, the, this, as this swells, it actually compresses the veins that are supposed to drain the blood out. So as this swell, it blocks off the, the vessels that are supposed to empty it. And that holds the blood in there uh, for the most part. And, uh, causes this high pressure system that is a firm, rigid erection. Okay. And then, um, you know, after uh, ejaculation and orgasm, then those muscles, uh, the muscles in those blood vessels that are bringing the blood into the, the penis uh, start to contract. That decreases that blood flow in, and those veins uh, get decompressed, and the blood can flow out, and the uh, penis becomes soft and flaccid again. All right, probably a little TMI, but, but good to know.
Uh, the first line treatment for erectile dysfunction is uh, typically medications uh, like Viagra and Cialis. Okay. Um, these medications improve, you know, they help dilate those uh, vessels that bring the blood into the penis and uh, increase blood flow in, in, uh, into the penis. And, um, uh, uh, and that's really our first line treatment. Uh, what's good to know is uh, medications like Viagra and Cialis are now uh, generic and should be affordable. So, you know, back a few years ago, uh, I would see a lot of patients and I would say, hey, what you need is Viagra. And they would go to their pharmacy and say, look, doc, you know, they wanted hundreds of dollars for this medicine and I can't do that, uh, understandably. Uh, but the good news is now it should be pretty much affordable for everyone. And even if insurances don't cover it, there are uh, um, uh, mail order pharmacies that we use where they just ship the medicine right to the patient at, a, at an affordable rate without even going through insurance. So I don't want anybody to think, gosh, those medicines are expensive. I, I won't be able to uh, afford that and I'm not going to, uh, to, to seek help, okay? Um, so again, it, it, these medicines don't just cause an erection. You still need some sort of stimulation. Uh, you need to take it uh, usually at least an hour beforehand. Um, typically, they last up to four hours, but medicines like Cialis can actually last even longer, up to 24 hours. And so you can be a little more spontaneous with those ty types of medications. Some of them can be affected by food. For example, Viagra. Uh, you know, I see patients that come in and they say, gosh, I tried Viagra, didn't work. And then I asked them and they were like, yeah, I went out to dinner, you know, had a nice dinner with my wife and then I took it and, and nothing happened. And, and so, you know, you need to know that, you know, eating a big meal can affect these medications and it's better, you know, better to, to um, take them on an empty stomach and, and have dessert before dinner. Um, some common side effects with these medicines. Uh, the most common is headache. Uh, you can feel like your face is getting red and warm. And get a stuff, stuffy nose. I think any medicine you take by mouth can cause upset stomach. You could get possibly lightheaded, dizzy, feel palpitations, um, muscle pain. These are all possible uh, side effects, but nothing, you know, scary. And, you know, as the medicine wears off, these things would go away. Um, one thing that you need to know is if you're on nitrates for chest pain, uh, uh, that, that is a significant contraindication to these medications, and you can have a significant drop in your blood pressure. Uh, so we would not prescribe those medication with patients that take those medicines, okay? Um, yeah, so that's oral medications, and that's always our first line treatment. Uh, another possible treatment, and sometimes people use this with oral medications, is a vacuum erection device. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, uh, Austin Powers, then you, you may be familiar with these devices. Uh, you know, you can get these devices um, uh, through, through a physician, uh, but you can also go to an adult store and, and, and purchase one of these. Basically, how this works is it's a tube that you put your penis into, and then you uh, either manually or they even have electronic ones. Uh, pump out the air inside the tube. So you create a vacuum in this tube and that vacuum draws the blood into the penis. And then you put this constrictive ring or band around the base of the penis to help hold the blood in. Um, uh, and so that's an option. Uh, a lot of patients try this and don't like it though, because it can have some side effects. You know, that band uh, can block the ejaculation. So when you orgasm, uh, nothing might, might come out. Uh, if uh, you could have bruising of the penis, the penis can start to feel cold and numb. You know, you're basically kind of putting a tourniquet around it. Um, uh, so uh, for that reason, a lot of patients uh, shy away from this, but you know, some people, uh, um, this is what they do. And so I, you know, encourage you uh, to try it if, if you think this might be a good option for you. Uh, there are also uh, intraurethral suppositories. So these are basically pills that you put into the tip of the penis. I do not prescribe these because A, um, I, uh, they don't seem to me to be any more effective than uh, oral medications. Uh, so, you know, and then they can cause 
issues and burning with urination and, and pain. And so I just skip this, uh, you know, I don't think it's a great option. Um, so yeah. So the next uh, is uh, the next uh, treatment when oral medications don't work, what I usually recommend is uh, self-injection. Uh, so these are medicines that you inject into the side of the penis. Oh, here's a picture that I was trying to draw, draw for you earlier uh, of, the, of the corpora and the urethra down here. So you'd want to inject it in the upper portion here of the, of the penis on the side because uh, you don't want to inject it into the urethra. So that's what that's depicting. Uh, so with these medicines, again, there's pharmacies we work with that can mail them right to your house. Then you would bring it into the office and we would demonstrate for you how to, to inject yourself. And you would inject, you know, the medicine straight into the penis and it should be working within 15 minutes. Um, okay. Um, these, uh, this is a great option for a lot of patients, but again, sometimes a lot of patients will say, uh, will shy away from this because of the idea of having to inject themselves. You know, obviously it can cause some pain um, at the injection site. You can have bleeding or bruising at the site. Uh, these are the, you know, you hear about the erections lasting longer than four hours. Uh, this is what can cause it. You know, Viagra, it's very unlikely to cause, cause those types of issues. But these medicines, if you inject too much, can definitely uh, cause a, a priapism, which is that erection that's uh, you know, it becomes an emergency after four hours. If you're having a, an erection, it becomes painful and, and uh, you know, can become an emergency. But, uh, you know, th those are some possible side effects. Um, finally, we get to uh, penile implants, and this is really the, the Cadillac treatment for erectile dysfunction. This is, you know, uh, pretty much guaranteed to work uh, because um, you're basically putting in a device, a lot like the artificial urinary sphincter that, uh, that I uh, went over earlier. It's another device that gets implanted inside the body that you can't see uh, on the outside. Again, there's a pump that goes in the scrotum, kind of like the sphincter I showed you earlier. And then, um, let me see here. Uh, this one is a, what's called a three piece that they're showing here. So there's cylinders that go into those corpora that I showed you earlier, those tubes that are supposed to fill with blood. These cylinders go into there. There's a reservoir that holds the fluid and then a pump here that the patient squeezes. And when they squeeze that device, it takes the fluid from inside that reservoir and puts it into these balloons, uh, giving a, a rigid uh, erection. And then there's a little button here at the top that you would press and that would release the fluid back out of here and into the reservoir. So you would just uh, kind of give your penis a squeeze to help that fluid go back into that reservoir. And then the penis would be soft and flaccid again. And so, like I said, there's, there's three types. There's the three piece that I just showed you, um, which is, like I said, the Cadillac uh, uh, treatment. There's a two piece that doesn't have that reservoir, basically the fluid in a two piece sits back here and then when you pump it with the pump it takes that fluid and brings it up to the front um, and, and you don't have a reservoir um, and then there's a, a one piece which is just a malleable implant so that would just be a bendable malleable implant that goes here and there's no pump there's no reservoir um, that's nice for guys that don't have great use of their hands that have difficulty using this pump um, basically uh, I always make the, refer the reference to remember that green Gumby character uh, that stopped the clay animation uh, Gumby is it kind of like that, you know, it's it, the, the penis is basically always firm, but you can bend it down. And then when you want to uh, use it, you just bend it back up. Um, and that's a, a, a one piece uh, malleable implant. Okay. Um, the surgery for these is hour and a half surgery, go home the same day, um, typically. Um, sometimes if I'm worried, I may keep a patient overnight for some IV antibiotics if they have a lot of risk factors for infection. Um, you know, the, the big risks of uh, a surgery like that, again, it's a mechanical device, so it could malfunction. Um, you could have what's called auto inflation where uh, it doesn't go all the way down. Um, if there's a lot of, you know, scar tissue, say around this reservoir, then the fluid may not all go back into here and you may uh, have 
somewhat of an erection at all times. Um, you know, the big worry we have whenever we put an artificial, you know, uh, a foreign body inside of someone is infection is what we worry about. Yeah, so in summary, again, erectile dysfunction is a very common problem and there's a lot of different treatment out, treatment, treatments out there. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about, about those treatments and, and, um, and, and go, over, go over them with you in the office. Okay. Yeah, so I'll take any questions that people may have about uh, erections or if you had questions earlier and about urinary leakage, I'd be happy to answer those questions as well. Okay, you can uh, feel free to ask questions, um, put it in the chat box and we can read them in the chat box. In the meantime, while we're waiting for questions, I'll put this, uh, this is my contact information. So this is my office number here. Uh, I, I see patients in two locations in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, but, you know, it, like I said, if, if anybody wants to discuss these uh, subjects further or has, you know, personal issues that they want to discuss and seek treatment for, please feel free to call and, and ask to schedule an appointment with me and I'd be happy to, to see you and discuss your concerns. Any questions? I usually, you know, I used to do these talks uh, a lot uh, back when I worked at St. Luke's uh, and it, it was, all, you know, it was pre-COVID obviously. So it was, uh, um, a lot more personal and I got to see everybody's faces and, and, and uh, hopefully we'll get back to that soon because I feel like that uh, uh, is a little more uh, informal and, and relaxed. Um, but, but yeah, again, if, if, if I'd be happy to talk to people in private uh, in the office if they'd rather do that. 